Amen. Well, welcome this evening. Uh, glad you're with us. <clears throat> Those of y'all who may be joining online, glad you're with us as well. Uh, we want to get started tonight with prayer. And uh, I know we've had a couple things that we prayed about last week, um, talking to about some surgeries and stuff, and Lisa's thing went well. Uh, she's still recovering, resting up, but uh, we've gotten good good comments and reports from her about her deal. Uh, got a good report, uh, pastor's doctor appointment the other uh, yesterday. So the he had the two hematomas, and one is completely gone, and the other one is still improving at a good rate. So uh, they're they're optimistic about that. Uh, also, I, I mentioned it. Y'all, y'all know Jack and Amy, and uh, Amy's dad, Thomas, uh, known him for years and years and years. He was having some tests and stuff done. Uh, thought it might be a cancer-related thing, but it is not. Uh, so their doctors had good reports on that. Um, so I saw that t- testimony today on Facebook. Uh, so is there anything else we can lift up in prayer tonight as we get started? Oh, yes, Cooper. And, and lots of uh, Corey's family has been going. It seems like with every time one kid gets well, the next one drops. And then as soon as they start to get well, the next one drops. And then after they all had flu, then some of them had COVID. And then after they all had COVID, somebody had strep throat. And so. Yeah, my sister in law has some COVID and the other two brothers and sisters have type B. Yeah, the type B flu, I'm hearing a lot about that. So just, I mean, again, that's just going around. It's that time of year. I, I was telling Amber today we uh, were looking at the weather report because this is that kind of funny time where you don't want to, um, you don't want to turn your air conditioner on because it's not quite cold and like you know not quite hot enough outside. But then the house starts getting kind of um, muggy and and so I was messing with. I was like turning on the fan and turning on the ceiling fans and all that, but. Uh, I kept looking at the thing and it said it's going to be about 70 degrees for like 10 days. And I was like, oh, darn, you know, it's such a bad, you know, 40 in the morning and 70. Uh, like I said, I always think back to my days with cable. We had more outages and stuff this time of year because of those 40 degree ca- temperature swings. But uh, it also does something to our sinuses. And Amber's been dealing with that junk all week. So, yeah. Yeah, so just wanting to pray for all of that stuff. It's uh, even if it's just a nuisance, it's still a nuisance, right? So um, just want to pray for that. Uh, I know that there's probably some things we've been had. Lisa, even though she's at home, has been posting some things on our Facebook prayer page. Uh, so you know, please check onto that if you're not already a part of that page. Um, we can add you there. It is the prayer page on Facebook, and if you're watching on Facebook and you're wondering what I'm talking about, uh, it is kind of a separate page, and it is by invite only because we reserve the right to kick you off, too. Like, if somebody's just being silly in there, uh, we're not going to deal with that. But um, uh, So we do have a separate uh, prayer page that we post some things to. If you ever want to just throw that out there and, and have people praying, we've had several things this week that we put on there. And, uh, and and we do, you know, honestly look at that and not just go, oh, you know, it's on Facebook now, everybody. We do try to stop, take some time to pray uh, over that stuff too. So, all right, well, let's just get started tonight and let's just ask the Lord to be with us. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you for um, just the power that, that uh, you bring God over every situation. We... We don't understand how to get through some of these dilemmas that we have. But God, you're so faithful to us. You're so gracious. And I just ask you and, and for these needs that we've already seen uh, a miracle. We've seen touches in the body and, and surgeries, Lord God. I know that, God, you, you've been had your hand right there in every one of them. But God, I just ask that you continue. God, there's a lot of things that we might be dealing with in the body that we haven't been to the doctor, don't even know something's going on. But God, you know us from the moment we were formed in our mother's womb. 
You even know the number of hairs on our head. And so, God, I just ask that you uh, cause every crooked place to be made straight. Uh, every scare has to go away. Uh, God, I just thank you for it. I'm thankful for your faithfulness to us, even when we don't deserve it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen, amen. and amen. Uh, praying for the youth tonight, too, just as I mentioned, uh, we have a young man, uh, Caden and him, or as Larry's bringing around the offering plate, Caden and, and uh, Nathan Franklin, who's back here, uh, his dad is a pastor at a church in South Lake, Ricky Franklin, uh, an assemblies of good Assemblies of God church out there. Um, but Caden and Nathan were uh, roommates at camp when they were 16 years old. And uh, Nathan is now a uh, missionary to El Salvador. And he's here tonight. And uh, he's sharing with the kids back there in the back about uh, some of their stuff because the kids are talking about Speed the Light and missions, the missions arm of the Assemblies of God that is youth-driven, and it's Speed the Light. If you all don't know about it, I think we probably talked about it, but their, their, kind of their motto is uh, efficient transportation and effective communication to spread the gospel. And that uh, you know sounds like a mouthful, but when we got to go to El Salvador, uh, you really got to see firsthand uh, it, it wasn't all about just buying brand new vehicles for missionaries, which some of them need. Uh, they, they typically buy a lot of Toyota 4Runners because they seem to last forever. Uh, was talking to a friend of ours that's a missionary, Kyle Embry, and uh, after he had put 300,000 miles on it, they offered to let him buy it. And so he bought it because it's had every oil change, every upkeep on it or whatever and he said man this thing still runs he said the seats are a little more wobbly and you know some of the plastic stuff's broken he said but it still runs like it did the day i drove it off the lot so uh they buy good cars when we were in el salvador uh three truck three vehicles really stuck out to me one was the big yellow school bus that we were going everywhere on and Riding a school bus is always interesting because, you know, I don't know if they have them now, but there's no seat belts really to speak of. Uh, uh, the seats on this one were not exceptionally padded or comfortable or spaced out very far. I seem to feel like seats had more room when I was a kid riding a school bus. But uh, these, you almost had to sit, you know, to be able to get your knees in between there. But that big yellow school bus driving down those tiny roads on the sides of mountains in El Salvador... Yeah, <laughs> and and they don't and the bus driver never stops. That's the rule I've learned. If you go to El Salvador, if a bus is coming, you move because they're not going to stop. They're not going to get out of the way. They're going to go beep beep and just you better stop moving. But bus driver, I just tried not to watch. But that was one vehicle that's provided by Speed the Light for that uh, Castillo del Rey where we were at. The other vehicle that stuck out to me because it helped us out so much was an, a little Nissan pickup. Uh, Richard's not here tonight, but it's a little Nissan pickup like what Richard drives. And that thing had, I mean, more ugly dents on it and more scrapes and scratches than anything. But when we had to move a pile of 300 block, concrete block, Haydite block, uh, not Haydite, is concrete, pure concrete block. From, from Probably from where I'm standing, it'd be like we're over here to, to over here by the barn. We had to move that that hay dot or that concrete block by hand, two at a time. And I was going, man, this this is going to be the job all day, just moving 300 block. And then this little truck pulls up, and our translator says a few things to the men, and they said, sure. They dropped the tailgate of that thing, and we put as much as we could, and that little truck was driving like this, <laughs> tail dragging the ground. But it it was able for us to load that truck to get it over to there. So we were actually able to finish building the wall. Uh, Mindy, your dad was down in the hole laying the brick. He, they, they picked him right out right away and said, hey, he looks like he could build something. And so he was down there, and I was shoveling mud, and we were doing all kinds of stuff. The third vehicle uh, uh, that we saw that I loved looked like an Aaron's rental truck. If you see those little front uh, snub nose Suzu pickups, those big box trucks that they Aaron's uses it was the same truck but instead of a box on the back it had a cage 
like like for hauling goats or something like that. But it wasn't for hauling goats, it was the church bus. Uh, because, <laughs> because there was a mountain with about a 60 degree pitch uh, uh, up on top of that hill at Castile, right outside of Castile del Rey. And uh, there was two ways to get up there, a four by four vehicle or by foot. And we saw a lot of little ladies and their kids and, and some men, but a lot of women. There's there's an epidemic of no men in El Salvador because of wars and all those things. Any men that were of an age that could had to fight in the Civil War just so that they could turn around and elect a, a, a communist president. But they they all these men, There's from 18 to 50, there's almost no men. So you have all these women going to church and walking barefooted up this mountain to get to this deal. And we were in the back of a camion, the, the big truck, and holding on for dear life, thinking if this thing moves a foot that way or a foot that way, it's going to tip over. Uh, but it didn't. The driver knew exactly what he was doing, got us up to the top of the mountain, and then we had a tremendous worship service. The other part of that, the effective communication, uh, everywhere we went, seems like we had a little portable PA system with two speakers and a little mixer board, and they'd have a microphone. And they'd, we'd get to a little church that just looked like nobody had been in it, but they'd sweep it all up, unhook that, pull the two speakers out, and then hand the preacher the microphone. And we'd sing. We had an old guitar up there that I don't think had been played in 15 years, and they just handed it to you said, you play guitar, you play guitar. And I was like, I don't know if I can or not. But we got it done. Uh, but all of those things, and that's why youth do a lot of mission trips to places like Castile del Rey. Uh, they have a place there in El Salvador. They have another encampment, I think, in um, uh, Nicaragua uh, and a couple other places there in the south. And um, you guys may or not remember uh, Dallas and Shelly Reyes. Uh, they are going to be headed down there, uh, and they're itinerating to go down south. And uh, they're involved with Castillo Del Rey. So anyway, Nathan is part of that, uh, praying for them, because I'd love for the kids to get a passion for the missions side of things. As we're talking about that, I, I know I'm just kind of off on a tangent, but tonight we're introducing our new unit, and that is the church, uh, the body of Christ, the church. And uh I got a quote here. It says, Abraham Lincoln famously said, All I am or can be, I owe to my angel mother. There's a lot of us that can point to someone like a parent or a teacher and say, They made me who I am today. Um, I got to thinking about a teacher that I had, and uh, I was, he started off the school year calling me Beavis. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the MTV show, there. <laughs> It was called Beavis and that other guy, and uh, it, uh, but I was always ironic. I had to be a handful for teachers because I I wanted to get up, I wanted to make good grades. I really did. So I'd get up in the front of the class, right in front of them, and then I'd talk and I'd cut up and all that. So I was probably they're probably thinking, why can't you just go to the back? You know, why can't you just sit in the back with the other distracting kids and. But this particular teacher started off the school year calling me and my other friend Beavis and the other guy, and and uh, and we thought it was funny. Uh, I'd even talk like him or just make jokes. But he, I can really remember as a young man, him being a teacher that helped me realize that teachers are humans, right? Because I mean, when you're young. You don't really have a good grasp on the fact that your teachers are just people trying to pay their bills, trying to, you know, get home at the end of the day. They still got to go home and cook their food. They still got to go home and do their laundry. They may have their own kids to deal with or whatever. And, and uh, you know, I remember having teachers that were pregnant or, or had some kind of things. And you just never, like, just out of sight, out of mind. But the reason Mr. Reeves was such a... Uh, impact on me is because he wasn't afraid to share some of his vulnerability with us as as students and uh, I'll never forget <laughs> we were building a catapult I'm the only kid he's told me ever that he's ever had that got a concussion in his class 
we were building a catapult, and uh, we were all a bunch of football players. I mean, 80% of the class was athletes. And so we, we loaded the counterweight probably twice as heavy as it needed to be. So we're trying to hold this catapult down. And I knew once we let this thing go, there's no telling which way it was going to go, how, if it was going to ex- explode and just pieces of shrapnel were going to fly everywhere. And <laughs> we counted to three, and we let go. Well, I took off in a dead sprint, like thinking, if I don't get away from this thing, something's going to hurt me. And I'm looking back at the catapult, and I'm running like this, and I run smack into a concrete wall <laughs> right on the edge of it. Just my face right on the edge of this. It was the art building where they used to set like clay and stuff out there to, to dry or cure. And I ran smooth into it. And the next thing I remember, I was laying on my back. And I looked up, and one of my friends was standing over me like this. And he laughed. My teacher laughed and laughed. And I saw him, I'm not kidding you, 10 years later. And he said, man... You run into any walls lately? <laughs> and uh, But what also happened with Mr. Reeves is uh, he was in his early 40s, and they he had two daughters, but he found out his wife was pregnant, and they were going to have a son. And he was uh, just over the moon, just excited, going to have his boy, going to, you know, going to have a son. And... He finals were coming up, and he said, guys, I may not be around because my wife's due any day now. And as soon as that happens, he's like, I'm going to have y'all's final all queued up, but, um, but it could be any day now. He gets a call, uh, has to leave school one day to go to the hospital because it's time to have the baby. And his little boy that his wife had carried to term for nine months was born stillborn. And we were devastated because we loved our teacher. I wasn't a Christian yet at this time. But what was powerful to me was that he was just a human. He was just a man who was devastated by life's stuff. But he was just open and honest with us about it because he he came in and he said, Guys... I really am not going to be here that long today, and I'm just going to tell you, your final exam is going to be this worksheet. If you study this worksheet, you're going to pass your final exam. And I think the teachers and and the principals and everybody was just fine with that because of what he was going to have to go through at that moment. So I know it's a long story, but we all have somebody like that that was a teacher, a Sunday school teacher, uh, somebody like that that we could point to that really helped push us maybe in, in the way that we should go. Um, or I hope you have. Uh, hopefully you've had that opportunity because I've had some good ones. He's not the only one, but he comes to my mind because he also, through all that crisis, taught me that it was important to have faith. And he was honestly one of the reasons why, it's a long story, but I, I was already feeling this drawing. And I know now that that was just the Spirit saying, Come on, come on home. Come on back to the fold where where you've got a calling on your life. But I was already feeling that like I remember looking at my then girlfriend at the time and saying, you know, I just I really ought to go to church. I really ought to try to go to church. And uh, we ended up going to church together. So uh, people make a real difference in our lives. And what we're talking about today is going back and looking in the early church and seeing there were some people that may not have been that personally connected with us, but they did some things to show us how we can live our life out as a part of the ecclesia, which is the church. So really, technically speaking, we can't really call this building the church because really this building in and of itself is a building. Uh, the former superintendent of uh, the Assemblies of God, the general superintendent one time, Mr. Wood, uh, pastor or doctor, I guess, George Wood, was asked one time because they had a building for sale and 
And a group that wanted to buy it was not a Christian group. They were some religious group or something in that area. And they wanted to buy the building. And, and uh, there were some people that were real disturbed by that. And he said, they sought out Pastor or Wood's in instruction. And he said, let me ask you this. Have you ever bought a pickup truck? They said, well, yeah. And he goes, what, what do you do with the pickup truck? Well, you drive it and you use it until it's not where you can use it anymore, and then you sell it or you get rid of it. And he said, why is a building any different? He said, because the church exists because of the church. So because if, if, if we're caught up in exactly that this building is the only thing that holds us all together, if we have a fire tomorrow, we're in big trouble. Because you have to hope that if something burns what you know to the ground, that you're not just totally... To now, I will be devastated but I would be comforted by the idea that, that I still would get to see you guys. I still would, and whether we had to move over to a, you know, a community center or borrow another church's building or whatever we would have to do in the meantime, we could still have a relationship together as Christ intended, even if we don't have these chairs or these instruments or these lights or whatever it is that we count on for that. The central truth about today today's lesson, is that the, the church was never an afterthought to God's plan. Sometimes people think that, well, the church was just what, what God had to put in place because the Israelites failed so miserably, but that's not the case. What the church is, is it's a des uh, designed group of people, and God's been doing this since Deuteronomy. If you look over in your Bibles, if you have them, and you look at Deuteronomy chapter uh, 4, verse 10, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, it says, Never forget the day when you stood before the Lord your God at Mount Sinai, where He told me, Summon the people before me, and I will personally instruct them. And then they will learn to fear me as long as they live, and they will teach their children to fear me also. Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, literally just means a repeat, repeating of the law. So if you go through and you read it, uh, we've talked about this before, sometimes you try to read the Bible from the beginning, you can get through Genesis pretty well. Uh, you know, in Exodus, those are kind of story lines of everything. Uh, Leviticus gets a little bit more complicated because he starts getting real specific about, you know, well then, if you're going to build the temple, then this is how, you, or the tabernacle, this is how you have to build it. This is how you're going to serve. This is how you're going to sacrifice. And it gets very in the weeds for somebody who's just trying to understand the story of God. Excuse me, y'all. I'm about to sneeze. We might have to take a commercial break for that, the way I sneeze. But they, in Deuteronomy, Moses is, is reiterating the law and the guidance of what his people need to do. And it was prudent for them to gather together to hear it. Why? So that they could understand it, but also so that their children would be able to... It says, you would teach their children to fear me also. So we all have this um, relationship that starts all the way back in the Old Testament. It's something that's supposed to be personal and, and life-changing. Not just because God does a miracle in our life, which if we come to salvation, that's a great miracle because the reality is, is that we're all dead in the trespass of our sins, but yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have that miracle that we live by, but it's intended to be so much more than that because the church is supposed to be a place where we can experience genuine faith through what? Through hearing the gospel. It says that how will they have faith except for that they hear and how will they hear except for that there's a preacher. Um, you know, it's the, the, the job of a preacher didn't pass away just because the Levitical priesthood passed away. What happened and what we're going to see tonight when we talk about Acts here in just a second is that that anointing just moved from one small group to the, to the body to where everybody can experience anointing of the Holy Spirit to get knowledge and to understand who God is, what He is like, what He's not like, and, and quite frankly, all that he has done. 
The thing about understanding what he's like and what he's not like is what we are overwhelmed with in our culture today is all these ideas about God that have no basis whatsoever. The ideas of what happens after we die. And sometimes people could get real worked up about it because if we get into the details, and I'm not going to go off on a tangent tonight, but what happens when we die is clarified in the Bible. God already has angels. He doesn't need us to go be an angel for him, right? But we hear all these things, and it becomes this reckoning that people go, well, I don't like that, so I just I don't, I don't like to believe that God. I like, you know, as one movie was very sarcastic in saying, he's like, I like, you know, my little 8-pound, 11-ounce baby Jesus. That's the one I think about when I pray. And you go, then you're not, then you're, you're totally discounting what Jesus is, who Jesus is. It's what I said Sunday, and it got me when I was studying on it was, was that that root, that tree, that, that limb that we have to branch into was already bruised and cut open for us to be grafted in. That didn't come without sacrifice, and that's who Jesus is. And if we don't go back the way that, that, that he did in Deuteronomy, uh, when I say he, I'm talking about Moses, we have to go back and understand that we should be summoned together. We should be grouped together so we can do that. If we read in Psalms 22, verse 22, he says, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. And verse 25 says, I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those uh, who worship you. This, this verse in Psalms 22 is also the place where uh, David writes it, but Christ repeats it on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But David and the people of his time got to understand that they may feel forsaken, but yet he says, I will praise you in the great assembly. I'll fulfill my vows in the presence of those as we worship you. If you look at the, the life-giving words that we can pass down, we can go and look at the story of, of Stephen uh, in Acts chapter 7. Let me, I'm just going to grab this Bible so I can have it all together. But in Acts chapter 7, y'all understand the story of Stephen. The, the Holy Spirit has come because in Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells the followers of him that they, they need to tarry there in Jerusalem. And, and they all get there and they get in one mind and one accord. And the Holy Spirit moves and they're filled with the Holy Ghost. And Peter preaches a message that 3,000 people are added to the kingdom of that day and to continue in the doctrine of the disciples. So there's a, a, a facet of people that's already exploding. We don't know if Stephen was in the upper room of those gathered. We don't know if maybe he was one of those people that was standing out in the courtyard that overheard this crazy, you know, spirit-filled, tongue-talking people and didn't know what was going on and maybe God moved upon him. But what we do know is that when he shows up in Acts chapter 7, he's witnessing and he's, he's testifying to the fact that Christ has... Uh, uh, done all of this for people who didn't appreciate what he was doing. He was looking at Jewish people and saying, Jesus Christ died for you and you had him murdered. You were the ones who he died for, even though he knew you were calling for his name to be murdered. And in verse 37 of Acts chapter 7, or she, uh, yeah, verse 37, uh, it says, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is who was in the congregation in the wilderness with me, uh, w with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. Verse 39 says, Whom our fathers would not obey but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. In other words, y'all heard this prophet Moses, because Moses was a prophet in his own. He heard from God and he portrayed to the people. He said, you heard this and you turned away and rejected him. 
So now we have to come to the recognition that, that, that we're doing the same thing, but we have to be able to uh, come back to the relationship that this was calling us to. And when he started talking about the fact that they were all culpable for this sin, it was making enough people mad that they decided to stone him for what he was sharing, for this gospel that he was challenging them with. The, the Old Testament Israelite community really foreshadows the New Testament church because God establishes this group of people that he wants to coexist with, but in many ways uh, be separate from the world around them. So we, we know that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Well, that's hard to do. Like that's hard to really, to really grasp that is difficult because kind of what happens to us and this is very this is where we could get into a lot of muddy water is because it would it would be great if we could just go home and say you know what I am no longer going to partake in things of the world I am not going to I'm not going to do anything evil I'm not going to 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 take anything from anybody who's evil but then you have to go to the grocery store and you got to buy milk And you realize that the milk company supports who knows what, right? Abortion or some movement that we don't agree with. And then you got to buy some tennis shoes. And then you realize that the tennis shoe company supports all of these ridiculous uh, narratives that are going on in the media. that They absolutely try to get presidents canceled. They try to get congressmen canceled because they have so much money. They have all this power. And the next thing you know, you're like, well, I can't wear those tennis shoes. And pretty soon, I think maybe the person who really got it was John the Baptist. Because he just wore camel skins and lived out in the, the, the wilderness and ate honey and locusts, right? Because he was just like, I can't be a part of any of this. I can't be a part of any of this. So how do we truly exercise that out of being in the world but not being of it? Well, I, I think I would submit to you today that the way to do that is not necessarily to just say, we're not going to partake with anybody that's not like us, but what we're going to do is we're going to say, I'm not going to take on that identity of the things that are not of Christ. Because if I have Christ represented in my life, if I'm carrying this cross that he's told me that I should carry, I always say this is that I think that we have to carry that cross Because when something gets into our life that we don't have that cross right there so it can be crucified on that cross just like Jesus was. We have to be able to take those things that pull us away from following Him and worshiping Him in spirit and in truth and we have to be able to set those things aside and be able to do that. So if the tennis shoes that you're wearing are causing you to not be able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, then don't buy those tennis shoes. If the TV show that you are watching is causing you to be disrupted and causing you to be pulled away from those things that are in Christ, I'm not saying that it it makes everything else okay, but Paul said that all things are lawful, they're just not expedient. So we are covered by the grace that we can't be responsible for everybody else's actions, but we can be responsible for ours. And what we have to know is that when the Spirit starts to tell us something, then we can just know that that's a conviction from the Lord. So if your conviction is to go live in the woods and wear camel skins and eat locusts and honey, then I'm going to back you up 100%. Because I feel like if that's your conviction, then the Holy Spirit's putting that on you. But make sure that it's of the, the standard of understanding the Scriptures because we like to separate those things. And that's why it's so dangerous for people to say, well, I believe in God and I love God, but... You know, I don't really like the whole church thing. Because, I'm sorry, I have not really met very many people who really can live that out. It might go for a while. I've seen people who say, well, these churches, man, they just always hurt you. They're just so, they're full of, well, guess what? The churches are like hospitals, or they should be. They're full of sick people. They're full of hypocrites. They're full of people that need Christ. Why would we build a car wash if all the cars were already clean? Right? So so there's going to be those problems. But I see people all the time. We're witnessing it right now with a friend of ours 
that's saying, I'm just done with all that. But I'm telling you that they're long term. That never will be satisfactory for you to be disconnected from the body of Christ and say that you're still in communion with Christ. He calls us to be in, in partnership, fellowship with Him and with His people. That's why He, I believe that's why in Acts chapter 1, if you go back to Acts chapter 1, that's why He told them that they needed to get together. They needed to get together for the of His promise. The fulfillment of His promise was is that I'm going to go away, but I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. And they were going to have a great uh, challenge before them. They were going to have a great challenge before them to not only now live in a world where they weren't following him around and saying, what are we going to do next, master? What are we going to do next, teacher? What, what's the next thing on the list? Where are we going to go and see people healed? They were just going to have to, to go as, as God, Jesus, called them to in Matthew 28. He says, now go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit and making disciples. Now you just got to go without this, you know, direction. You know, uh, I'm kind of the type that when we go on a trip, uh, and it will drive Amber a little bit crazy, but I like to know what we're going to do. You know, wh what night are we going to try to do certain things? And she's like, oh, well, we can... You know, we could just find out when we get there. And that's fine sometimes, but sometimes we end up super disappointed because we'll get there. Uh, I remember during COVID, we, we got just to go get away for a couple of days. There was one spot in Oklahoma that had some cabins, and we went and rented a cabin. And I wanted so bad to just go rent a little boat and just get out on the lake. It was beautiful. It was in the summertime, and they had no boats. And I was, it like, it made what would have been a great trip, it made me pout for like two days because I didn't get to do what I wanted to do because we didn't plan it out ahead of time, right? So I would have probably been one of those disciples that's like, where are we going, Jesus? What are we going to do next? You know, not paying attention to all the stuff around me that could be done, but worried about where are we headed, where are we headed? And so they had this amazing, incredible task in front of them to now have to shift from just following Jesus to being leaders of men, 12 apostles that he was going to have to choose. And it was so important that he prompted them to replace Judas. I think another powerful reason why we see that done is because the church is imperfect, because the church is does have people that are a leader one day, I always wonder, what did Judas do on those trips when Jesus would send them out? Did he just stand there and go, oh, I can't believe we're doing this again? Or did he pray for people? Did he lay hands on the sick and see them recover? It always says that the disciples came back and said, we saw uh, demons cast out. We saw sickness healed in your name. And Judas was a part of that, at least initially. We don't have, we can make a lot of speculations, but we don't know. And so I always wonder, but there was a point when something turned in his heart. People, a lot of uh, scholars that know a lot more about the Bible and history than I do talk about the fact that they, you know, when they're naming all the disciples, they talk about Simon the Zealot, not, not Simon Peter, but the Zealot. They were like, hey, it's time to be, mount up and have a war of Israel versus the war of, you know, the the armies of Rome, and, and let's just go head-to-head head because God will be on our side just like he was for Gideon, right? And there was a group of people that were ready to do that, and that some of them joined Jesus, thinking, here's our next King David, here's our next commander. But some of them came to the realization that was never going to be Jesus' thing, but some scholars, again, they're still just speculating, we don't know, but some people look at that and go, well, that's why Judas turned, because Jesus wouldn't take up a sword and fight. And so he figured he might as well sell them out. But here's what happens. Even if we're, somebody in that group, somebody was following Judas, they had to be totally, utterly de destroyed and betrayed. In fact, the disciples, when they were together and they were talking about it, they went back and they were reading things 
uh, uh, Peter was saying, well, this is, was foretold that this man was going to go and he was going to hang himself and he was going to commit suicide. He was going to do all this stuff and it was actually sp spoken about, prophesied. So we know that this was supposed to come to pass. Now, that's a pretty bleak observation to say, well, we know this guy was going to betray Jesus and then kill himself. But the reality is, is that people in the church fall every day. Ministers fail. Families fail. I know when we lived in Abilene, Amber called me one day and she was just so distraught. And I said, what is wrong? And she just goes, everybody's going crazy. Everybody's losing their mind. And I was like, you're going to have to be more specific. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then she told me about a family in the church that just seemingly overnight, they were going to divorce. And I mean, he was a mentor to us. And, it, it, and she and her, her, the wife and Amber were great friends. But all of a sudden, overnight, things broke. Something broke there. It wasn't overnight. It had been going on for a while. But in our perception, somebody just walked out and left, and this thing broke, and it put a hole in our church, and it, it caused all kinds of difficulty for all of us because we were a tight family, you know? But I think that we get this beautiful picture of them choosing Matthias in Acts chapter 1. Uh, in verse 15, Peter stood in the midst of them, uh, the disciples together, and the number of names was about 120. And he said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. So that's what tells me that Judas was there for it until he wasn't. He was a part of it until he wasn't. And he says he obtained a part in this ministry. And if you skip down to verse 20, uh, 1, it says, Therefore of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness to us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. So what do they do? They said, look, there's a hole. There's a brokenness here. But the Lord would have us to restore it. Not to say, well, we're just going to have to figure out how to move on with just the 11 of us. But yet that God has a plan for restoration. And obviously it was Judas was, was out. But God wanted to make that whole. And they were looking at it as, you know, there's 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus picked 12 of us, so we should be 12 strong. And they said, let's, let's pray about it. These two men, out of all the... It tells you there was 120 in that room. So I, by my count, that's what, 111, or excuse me, 109 other candidates, if you will. Yeah, well, I'm saying other than the 11 that were already dis, uh, the apostles. Don't get me doing math in my head. Hang on, I'm going to get a pencil. 120 minus 11 was 109 people in that room. I don't know how many were women that probably weren't going to be considered. But 109 people, they got two that they offered up to the Lord and said, who's it going to be? And this is one of the last times that you see in Scripture where they cast lots, cast lot to see who was going to be chosen. But they left that up to the Spirit and the power of God, and he, they anointed Matthias to take his place. So now, having been made whole in leadership, they were ready, and they were in one mind and one accord, which tells me that even though he wasn't chosen, that uh, Mr. Barsabbas Justice was okay, because he hung around, and they still prayed in one mind and one accord for the advancement of the gospel, to still let those words burn in them that Jesus said before he left, and that was to go and make disciples. So Matthias is chosen, 
and, and we get to see the early church powerful enough to inspire somebody like Stephen to stand up and say, you can do what you want to me, but I'm going to preach this gospel. And you had these 12 disciples, and we know that Paul came on quickly after because when he was on his road to Damascus, uh, he got called to be an apostle of, to the Gentiles. That sometimes God just has to knock us off of our donkey to get us where he wants us, put some, put some blindness in our eyes so that we quit focusing on what we see and focus on what he's telling us, what we're hearing, and he puts them in the right place. The church, and what we're going to talk about for the next several weeks is the church has not been an afterthought in God's mind. The church has not been something that, that man constructed just so that we could have another institution to have to try to prop up. That's, the, that's one of the biggest attacks right now on the ministry, and not in churches, but the ministry right now, is that it doesn't make any sense for somebody to spend all, put all that kind of money into a church. It doesn't make sense to give 10% if you're, if you're believing what the, the Word says about tithe and that that's a, that's a good, it's a great system to live by. The Lord rolled it, into, it, 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 rolled it out by the, the agreement just that started between Abraham and Melchizedek, I believe. First time you see tithe in the Bible. But it's exercised not just in numbers, but in what God does when we allow Him to take 10% of our stuff, that we call our stuff, like that somehow we got it. But I have air in my lungs because of Him. I don't have to pay a tax on that. I have the ability to learn things that I've been able to do with my mind and I don't have to pay a tax on that, so I feel like at the very least, it's the least I could do to sacrifice something. And what God has shown me, I, got, I, got, I was testifying to a gentleman back here the other day. Uh, we were waiting on some crew to show up. It was one of those days that it was bitter cold outside, and I just had him come in and ask him if he wanted a cup of coffee. And he was telling me that the Lord has really gotten a hold of him in the last eight years about his first fruits and tithing and that his wife was a real estate agent and they made a good profit on a deal and he said all right honey it's time to write that check and she was like oh are you sure like that much because y'all know i mean you can 10 percent if you're if you're gonna go by that now again i say if you're gonna go by that not because i'm saying that you don't have to i'm saying it because paul said maybe you should do more in Acts, in Acts chapter 2, they gave up all that they had so that everybody had what they needed. But let's just talk about the principle of tithing. This gentleman said, you know, uh, I, we just decided that's what we were going to do. And he said, it's, it's incredible to me, and it doesn't make sense how we've been blessed. And I said, you know, I think when you realize that, sir, I said, that's when God tells you that he's got it. Because it doesn't make sense. But you know what also doesn't make sense? That somebody would come out of heaven that didn't do anything wrong and take on all of my sin and all of your sin and then and let himself be killed for it. That doesn't make any sense either. But they weren't afraid to make him be the first fruit so that all of us could be sanctified after that. If you don't believe in tithe, then what did Jesus do? Right? I'm glad he's not just one that only nine other people were going to get saved. He wasn't a 10% sacrifice, but his sacrifice was great enough for mine, and for yours, and for the murderer in the prison. It doesn't matter because the sacrifice was good enough. But out of all of that, he didn't intend for it to die with the few people that were around him when he was there. He set forth this in motion, this body that we would call the church, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks. Can we just pray? Talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what we're going to get into next week. Father, I just thank you so much for the 
this church body, God. And I know that there's a lot of people that are a part of this fellowship. God, I'm thankful for them. But God, I'm thankful for those that are just even outside of our little circle. God, I'm thankful for a young man back here that I've only met a couple times, but he's doing ministry that we get to support all the way down in El Salvador. Seeing lives come to Christ. God, we're, we're seeing just a move of your hand by those that continue to live in the fear of God, teach it to their children, and endeavor to know what, who God is and what God is all about. God, we ask for that to be our cry tonight and a cry for your church in this, in this United States, that we can know who God is and what he's all about. And God, I just thank you for it. I give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen.